let's start off because we the the title here is basically eliminating heart attacks but that isn't exactly the way you started in your career so your career in cardiology was a little different earlier on tell everybody about that for a minute yeah so i spent about i trained at the university of chicago and then moved to new york in 2005 um had planned to do interventional cardiology um coronary disease is both clinical and research interest but in 2003, um, saw a 16 slice uh, CT. It was actually a four slice CT scan. It was probably the only good one that Phillips had. And Sam Wan, uh, who at the time was at, in Wisconsin, invited us up to this CT symposium. And I just thought that the modality would uh, change our understanding of coronary disease. Like, um, so we, so I switched over into imaging, and then. Tried to, uh, did an imaging fellowship, um, ended up at Cornell uh, Medical College in New York Presbyterian Hospital, where I uh, worked there for about 15, 16 years. And so um, during that time, like we had done, we'd used this tool, like, and everybody had said, oh, like he's the CT guy. Like I could care less whether or not it was CT or not. It was just a really good tool to under, better understand coronary disease. So did a bunch of trials and registries and then um, then applied that into a clinical program, prevention program called Heart Health that we ran for about seven and a half years or so. Um, and then um, I can, sh I think we're going to show some slides, but I'll show you how we did it. And then we, it was, and it ended up becoming very successful. Um, can I take five minutes, Rick, sure. and just, okay. Sure, so. I, I have to laugh. There are so many common threads here. Some of you in the room may know Sam as well. Sam was in Feigenbaum's lab right before I was there and actually taught me CT reading as well. So, and some other people in the room know him as well. Interesting, like, yeah. So I think we're on the precipice is my my guess of like, I'm hoping to way we change, the a change towards the way we approach coronary disease. And so I don't want this to be a commercial, like, uh, but I do want to emphasize that like when, when we started our company, we didn't try to be an imaging company. Um, we didn't try to be an AI company. What we wanted to do was standardize and personalize a digital care pathway. Um, so a care management platform for coronary disease. Well, so let me interrupt you before you even go to that. You were at Cornell. Everybody knew you from the CT world. You were doing a lot of research, and then you left Cornell to do – you were working on, on this sort of platform while you were at Cornell. I was, yeah. So what prompted – what's the difference here? Because this is important, I think, for all of us here. Why leave academia and go over to the private side? Yeah, it's a good question. I was just talking with Kuhn Neiman. Like, I mean, I still have two NIH R01s. I, I, the science is what drives me by far. Um, but I just, we, we had gotten a couple of products FDA cleared, and it was time to decide, like, do I want to be part of this company, or do I want to um, stay in academics and sort of root for the sidelines? And I, I joined the company to do this. And it sounds uh, lofty, uh, but I think it's possible uh, just based on our personal experience that we can, if you know, if we personalize the approach to medicine, then we can we can eradicate heart attacks. And so I um, I jumped out with the purpose of trying to get to universal worldwide screening um, of heart disease. That was the the intent. I don't know if we'll hit it. Um, I hope somebody does, and it doesn't have to be us, but. Um, I think fundamentally, like, we are doing it wrong. And so I'll share some preliminary data that we're submitting as a late breaker to American Heart. We did a, a survey using EHR claims data on about 300 some million lives and identified about 4.6 million people who suffered myocardial infarction. And we just asked four really simple questions. Is amongst those people who presented with first time myocardial infarction, what percent had seen a doctor what percent had risk factors, what percent had symptoms, and what percent uh, were on preventive medical, any preventive medical therapy. It turns out about 25% of them had never seen a doctor, 25% of them didn't have any conventional risk factors, 51% of them never experienced a symptom, and 75% of them weren't on any preventive medical therapy. So if you're not being treated, you're not being seen, you don't experience any symptoms, and you don't have any risk by our conventional definitions, then how else are we going to find these people unless we go upstream and just screen the world uh, for heart disease? And so that ultimately is our goal, at, clearly. And do you think, just uh, again to prosecute this for a moment, 
Do you think that the idea of doing it from the private side has its advantages then? I mean, are you able to move faster than you could when you were at Cornell? I think you can move faster, and then I don't think you can do it in academics. Like, I think that you reach a certain ceiling where, you know, you can't, like, we're done. We're, the, the trial's done, the paper's written, the podium presentation is done, and, and now what? So then I think you have to, and I thought, like, you know, that was the job, but it turns out that's like you get your 2% to product. And so there's all this other stuff that has to happen. And, you know, and then you've got to change the payers' minds and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's what you can do on, you know, outside of academics. So, I mean, this whole lofty notion of creating a world without heart attacks, like, you know, when we started the um, prevention program at Cornell, this was 2013. Like, we'd like to say we invented something, but we didn't. We just looked around and copied uh, the most successful preventive care paradigms. And what I realized is that, you know, as a resident, when I was being taught, like, all of the things we were doing 25 years ago have been supplanted over the last two decades by um, some sort of advanced imaging that allows for direct visualization of disease, right? Whether it's mammograms or colonoscopy, lung CT, even pap smears is direct visualization of disease. And when I look to see how I was taught as a cardiology fellow, we're doing it exactly the same way, right? We're really great at looking at upstream associative markers of heart disease. We, w we then tell people, go home and you know come back when you've got chest pain or shortness of breath, and then we'll put you on a treadmill. And what, what I realize is that those things don't work, right, when you look at the data. And if you said, well, what's the commonality amongst all of those failures is that none of them are actual heart disease, right? They're surrogates of heart disease upstream. They're downstream sequelae of heart disease, stenosis, ischemia. But we've never measured atherosclerosis or the coronary heart disease itself. And then what I also realized is that we use a lot of, we, we, um, we synonymize adjectives and nouns, right? Because for 30 years, we've called it ischemic heart disease. Well, the ischemic part is the adjective that describes the heart disease, but we've never looked at that itself. And so what we had tried to do during some of these trials is to better understand atherosclerosis. And what we found was surprising to us. Like, um, so this is sort of a Cliff's note synopsis of like a bunch of about 20 years of, of some of our data and other data. But, you know, I had this opportunity in 2007 or 8 to go on the Today Show and do Matt Lauer's CT scan. And he pointed to this area in his arteries like, oh, is that the good kind of plaque or the bad kind of plaque? And I sort of glibly replied like, Matt, there is no such thing as good plaque. It turns out like he was completely right and I was completely wrong. So when you look at this artery on a scan and it's color coded all the plaque, the red is the really dark, um, like non-calcified plaques. The gray is sort of lighter fibrotic plaques. And then the blue is obviously the white calcified plaques. And what we found was that the dark on a continuous basis, like the darker the plaque, the more dangerous the, the risk. And once it hits that red area, both in Scott Hart, in Iconic, in Promise, like um, all of these trials demonstrate that that was actually the strongest discriminator of who was going to experience a myocardial infarction or not. And it was independent of stenosis. The majority of the lesions were mildly stenotic. And then what we found was that on the opposite side of the spectrum, the brighter the plaque, um, the more um, the safer it was. And in fact, once it gets a certain brightness, we found that it was protective against myocardial infarction. So that sort of begged this question of like, oh, if the dark plaques are bad and the bright plaques are good, then how do you turn the, the bright dark plaques bright? And it, so we had done a study with statins. It's been replicated with PCSK9 inhibitors, a um, whole bunch of other medications, icospin ethyl, even a low salt diet and increased physical activity. None of those things meaningfully regressed plaque. What they did was they transformed it from this dark phenotype to this bright phenotype. And then that is what was associated with an eight year uh, reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events. So that was the whole thesis of clearly was to try to get this slide really to personalize the approach to heart attack prevention. The problem that we had were a couple, like one to make these little circles was taking us like eight hours per patient. So we knew that it would never scale. And then two, like if you're not an imager, then you don't actually have any idea what you're looking at. So the data is meaningless to you if you're a primary care physician or a general cardiologist without imaging background. And so this is sort of the heart health program that we adopted that into where we would start um, with a CT scan. We do serial CT every few years uh, to make sure we were turning these dark plaques bright. And then what we also wanted to do was to not, I think we as cardiologists always look at um, 
coronary disease is an LDL lowering phenomenon, but it's not. Like we call it a situational inflammatory cardiometabolic atherothrombotic process, right? And that is because we've got this huge toolbox of preventive medical therapies that all target each one of those things. And I think it's, we've, we've never had such an exciting time in prevention, right? Where you've got, I mean, I don't know if you guys saw the New England Journal paper this, um, but the tricretin that Lily has like resulted in a 60 pound, 24% weight loss, like over 48 weeks. We can, we can fix these problems, the metabolic syndromes, the cardiometabolic disorders and so on. And so the question was like, how do you do this in an automated way, right? So that you can standardize this and offer it at any facility. Let me stop you there for a minute because your program that you were running at Cornell, uh, the issues that typically people would ask is, first of all, gosh, aren't you given a lot of radiation? Yeah, at Cornell, we were giving submillisievert doses. On average, I think our, our average radiation dose across all patients was 1.3 millisieverts. And so, you know, frame of reference, cath is what, five, six millisieverts. Nuclear stress testing is about 13, 14 millisieverts. So, I mean, you're talking about mammogram level doses. So it's really safe at this point in time. Okay. And then the second question, so you can get down to really low with good, really good equipment, uh, down to, to sub millisiever. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're not there where we are, but we are between one and three. And so it's still really low radiation. What about, what about how paying for it? Because, you know, we, we had this discussion yesterday, you know, sometimes you can't get a regular CT paid for. Yeah, it's a good question. Like, I think we're going to have to develop. So we're doing um, two large scale randomized trials um, to try to get the policy recommendations to get covered and reimbursed for screening. Um, the way you do that is to go through the United States Preventive Services Task Force. And everybody knows they're most the most curmudgeonly evidence body, right? Like they just they, they literally refuse to give a positive recommendation for counseling for healthy diet and exercise. Like, I don't even understand like the, the psyche there, but I think that um, we, we've worked with, we are working with the former chair of the scientific task force for USPSTF, and she has helped us guide the design of our trials to try to get to universal coverage and reimbursement. But we have seen like in our experience, and then others seem like they have the same experience. As long as you say suspected coronary disease and you don't opine on the nature of the symptoms, the insurance co companies have covered the CT scan. So the people that you were doing, and we'll talk about our model that we're running and how we tried to play with this, but how did you pay for this? Right. I, I hear what you're going to try and do, yeah. but I want to know who, how that lady there that got her CT scan, did she pay for it out of her pocket? She didn't. Like in the vast majority of cases when we just literally wrote clinical indication suspected coronary disease, the insurance companies paid. And the plaque analysis at the time, you just... That was just part of what you were doing in the study. That was, yeah, we had six, we had the fortune of being um, supported by generous philanthropy. So we literally had 16 technologists just circling images all day long. But that was a philanthropic thing that I don't think other sites could do. It was also way too time consuming. It was eight to 10 hours per patient. So we knew we had to automate the whole thing. Okay, so that's really important. I, I want to go back to that. So you were quantitating plaque, but you were doing it manually with level three readers, if I remember correctly. Yeah, with certified CT technologists that we trained against IVIS and CT. Okay, so the technologists were doing it and it took them how long per case? About eight hours. So eight hours per case to quantitate. So you could do it manually, but that was part of the problem. Yep, okay. exactly. So there was a time efficiency problem. There was a literacy problem because nobody understood the images, right? And so we had to solve for that. And so that's why when we, um, we wanted to create a care pathway, not like a imaging tool or an AI tool, but just a care, a comprehensive care management platform. And so this is sort of what it looks like when we started. Like we said, okay, there'll be five steps to it. Now there's six, but we said the first step, we're gonna take the image and we're going to personalize somebody's heart disease evaluation, extract everything that we know to be important about that disease phenotype as it relates to somebody's prognosis. And then once we get all of this patient vessel segment lesion level information, now what we have to do is we have to take all of this 
disease phenotyping and translate it so that somebody can actually use it and understand it. If I'm an advanced practice um, professional, or if I'm a primary care physician, or if I'm a cardiologist. And so that's step two, is really translating things into actionable clinical insights. And then the third um, step was what we spent a lot of time in the office with the patients reviewing their images, because once they saw their images, the compliance rates went through the roof, right? Because they understood what we were treating, why we were treating, and how we were going to treat it. And so then the fourth uh, step came about, and that was maybe in, in theory the hardest thing. It's like, because how do you treat heart disease when we've never actually done that? We've spent all this time treating ischemia and stenosis, but never the atherosclerosis itself. And then finally, how do you track this um, over time quantitatively to prove therapeutic success or failure? So that that is the care pathway in a nutshell. It sounds con mm -hmm. so, so Jim, if you, uh, in looking at this, uh, could you use in an easier form if you couldn't get this coronary calcium scoring in the same way? Yeah, it's a good question. Like, so I, I used to write a lot of papers on calcium scoring and I stopped in about 2015 because I realized that calcium scoring won't save lives. And the reason for that is that I, there's a quote that I, I all, almost always use in, <clears throat> as the first slide in my lectures. And it's a quote by Albert Einstein. He says, if I had 60 minutes to solve a problem, my life depended on it, I'd spend the first 55 minutes trying to figure out the proper question to ask. And what I realized is the entire field of calcium scoring is asking the wrong question. Because the, what they're saying is like, look, if I've got a million people over here and a million people over here, and these have a calcium score of zero, and these have a calcium score greater than zero, is this prognosis better? And the answer is uniformly yes. We, we've known that for years. But that's actually not a relevant question because what I, what I care about is amongst a million people who are so subsequently going to suffer a heart attack, how many of those have a calcium score of zero? And it turns out it's about a third of them. <clears throat> if you look at the MESA study, if you look at Dallas Heart, if you look at our ICONIC study, all of those, somewhere between 25 and 35% of the people have a calcium score of zero and subsequently experience MI. And it's age dependent too. So the younger you are, um, the, the more likely you are to have a calcium score of zero. So it's not a great biomarker. It's better than LDL, um, but it's certainly nowhere near where we, where we need it to be. The other problem with calcium scoring is like when you treat it, um, the calcium score goes up. And when you get sicker, the calcium score goes up. So I can tell you that you're either getting sicker or you're getting healthier, but I can't, I don't know. And so, so you can't track it, like is the, the problem as well. So I think calcium scoring, like um, it, it's a step forward, but it, it, it's, it's imaging the wrong thing, right? Like we're imaging the stable plaque. And so that I think is fundamentally a problem. Um, and then people will talk about costs. Like, I guess I don't think about cost first. I think about clinical utility first. Then you can always ratchet down the cost to make it affordable to society. So I think that's why we, we, we ended up using CT angiography rather than uh, a calcium score. I do want to clarify that one thing on number four here, this treat, it says ACC, treat disease algorithm, just for the uh, audience. What that is, is uh, actually I helped a little bit with that. We had our innovative pr innovation program at ACC, and we put together a group of, of national experts. Uh, and so that was more ACC acting as a convener, mm -hmm. not, this is not a formal pathway from ACC. But it did include a variety of people. Uh, uh, well, uh, actually, uh, uh, Alan, one of your colleagues, uh, uh, David Mirren was one of the prominent people uh, on that panel that helped develop a proposed path uh, out treatment algorithm because they're really, you know, nobody's really done this before. I mean, this is on the front end because you're talking about primary prevention here, not secondary prevention. Exactly. Yeah. It's a different story, totally different story. This is all primary prevention. Yep. And this sounds like maybe this convoluted pathway. It's actually quite rapid and it's quite easy. So I'm just going to take another five minutes, seven minutes to show you what each of these steps look like. Um, and then, um, then maybe we can have a discussion around how, you know, how we could apply it. 
um, or whether or not it's actually useful or not. And the first thing we had to do was like extract all the data, right? And so what you see here are on the right are a number of different algorithms that have been developed to go in and to automatically extract the CT into a cloud and then parallel process all those algorithms so that you get all of this information um, in an automated way. And that, like you can see all of the, the yellow um, highlights over there, those are things that uh, calculate stenosis. And what we realized is that we were calculating stenosis wrong. Like what we do is we typically eyeball a you know single 2D image and then you see some sort of MLD and then we sort of eyeball the reference diameters. But what, what we don't do is we don't account for the taper in the artery, right, as it gets smaller and dist going distally. And so what we do is we interpolate, um, based on a regression algorithm, exactly what is the normal reference diameter at the site of the maximal stenosis. Now we get an apples to apples comparison of percent stenosis and then uh, normal reference diameter. And then all of the plaque information is also kept here too. And we've trichotomized the plaque as calcified, non-calcified, and essentially the CT equivalent of necrotic core. After that, what we do is we have an algorithm that we've developed that we said, well, you know, the, the problem with um, calculating ischemia from a CT scan is that you make all these assumptions. One of those assumptions is that the coronary wall is a rigid tube which is obviously not. And we have all this rich information around the coronary uh, wall. And, you know, we know that like um, necrotic core cause of vasoconstriction and lack of, and endothelial dysfunction. So what we wanted to do was just a very simple algorithm where we would take all this information, dump it into a mathematical model and just ask the mathematical model, a machine learned algorithm, is there ischemia or, or no ischemia? So we get that too in an unbiased way. And then this is sort of now how we translate it, right? So over here, now I can see on the right or on the left, like how much plaque this person actually has, what type of plaque they have, do they have any moderate or severe stenosis? Do they have ischemia? Um, where is that ischemia? What is the CADRAD score? And then we also wanted to make this centerpiece page interactive because we used to use it to educate the patients. So what we can do is we can press on any area and now you can go deep and show Mrs. Smith or Mr. Jones exactly what their arteries look like. And then you can start going deep into an overview or into the plaque morphologies and the high risk plaques and then also um, um, the stenoses as well. And then once you're done with that, then you can go and you can, if you're like a specialist, like a preventive cardiologist, then you can go deep into atherosclerosis, right? So all of this information now on a segment by segment basis is not around stenosis, but it's around the type of plaque, the burden of plaque, the high risk nature of the plaque. And then you can do this at a segment level, a vessel level, and, and so on. Once you're done with that, then you can now start to look at stenosis in a very um, in-depth way. And so what you see is like on the upper right is if you hover over it, you can see all the mild lesions, the moderate lesions, the severe lesions, and the chronic total occlusions. Or you can come down on the left and you can see all 18 coronary artery segments, the relative percent stenosis, the minimum luminal diameters, the normal reference diameters. And then if you click on any one of those tabs, then what you can say is, okay, I wanna dive in deep. Now you can do some pre-procedural planning because you know plaque volume, plaque type, you know lesion length, you know MLD, you know percent stenosis, you know re normal reference diameter. So you know exactly what you're dealing with in terms of the coronary lesion. Once you have that, then people say, well, then we also wanna know how that relates to the ischemia. And so here you could see like that um, you can lay out a vessel that is ischemic, and then you can see that you, you can get um, lesion one, and you can get lesion two, and start to understand which are the ones that you're gonna target uh, for your interventions based on all of those vascular and atherosclerotic morphologies. Okay, so that's all for the diagnosis of it. Um, and then the, the imager uh, has to put in this CADRAD score, so we also offer the CADRAD score. Um, what I wanted was the data, right? Because I like to do the research and I don't want to curate data. So you can see that everything on a patient, vessel, segment, lesion level is kept for you quantitatively related to the coronary artery related to all the atherosclerosis, and then you can just download it as an Excel spreadsheet and start doing research so you don't have to curate any data. 
And then everybody wanted this report um, for billing purposes, and so that's automatically uh, generated for you. The problem with the report is that nobody understands it and nobody reads it, right? So we do the report for ourselves and just defensively, but it doesn't help a clinician. So what we also do is we generate a clinician-level report. It's just a single page um, that highlights um, you know, red, yellow, and green, and what's good, what's bad, um, and so on. And then we also um, annotate, auto-annotate all of the images for them so that they can look at their patients' images. So the clinicians have really liked this a lot, but the patients hated it because they're like, I don't understand anything on this sheet of paper. So what we also do is we generate a patient level report. So this is at a fifth grade reading level intended for the non-medical layperson to really understand their coronary disease, where we answer a bunch of questions that are commonly asked to us when we are taking care of patients, help them understand through illustrations in the simple language, and then also help them understand how this disease phenotyping represents the integration and amalgamation of all of their risk factors that they've been exposed to over the course of their lifetime into a single metric that we can then follow. And then to, to Rick's point, this is not an ACC guideline, but we worked with the Innovations and in Prevention Working Group. And the first thing we did was we said, wait, we don't have a staging system for coronary disease. Like we stage every other disease, Alzheimer's, cancer, heart failure, asthma, but we've never staged atherosclerosis. So we, we came up with a staging algorithm on total plaque volume and percent atheroma volume. And then with that, what we did was we said, okay, based on those stages, we're gonna treat you, uh, the treatment intensity is going to equal and be commensurate to the disease burden. And so came up with a bunch of different ways that you can approach treatment that includes not just LDL lowering, but river oxaban and semaglutide and terzepatide and um, sotagliflozin and pagliflozin and so on. So that way you can really target this as an atherothrombotic process, but also uh, a metabolic process, an inflammatory process, and then even a situational process, right, where we know that you get about a 35% reduction in MACE events with just the flu vaccine. And so uh, considering the situations as well. And then the final um, slide that I'll show you here is that you can now quantitatively track disease and tell whether or not those dark plaques are turning bright or not. And so what we used to always tell the patients, there's not one goal here, there's two goals. The first is that if you come in with 260 units of plaque, we're gonna keep you at 260 units of plaque. We're gonna stop new disease from forming. And this is an interventional cardiologist actually who about three years ago was going through a tough time but started himself on a PCSK9 inhibitor. And now you can see that we've stopped the progression of plaque. But more importantly, as a second thing, we want to stabilize the pre-existing disease. And what you can see is that there was about an 80 uh, cubic millimeter reduction in the dark plaques, which was ex just counterbalanced by an 80 um, cubic millimeter increase in calcified plaque. So he stopped new disease and he transformed all the dark plaques into bright plaques as a mechanism of stabilization. And you can do this on the patient basis, but you can also do it even on the, the lesion basis where you can actually look at the lesions. And what you'll see here, like if you look carefully, is that what he's doing is he's calcifying all of his plaque. And so now we're, now he's he was going to stop the PCSK9 inhibitor and just go to low dose statins. And based on this, he's like, no, no, I'll, I'll stay on the PCSK9 inhibitor. So that's ultimately the pathway right there, right? And it's just automated and standardized and it's personalized. And so that's what we're trying to espouse. And now we're, we've got about we've got two randomized trials that we'll have first patient in later this year um, to test this in, in an outcomes trial. So uh, playing on that, because you are, uh, you are going to do RCTs, and I think Deepak Bhatt and, and again, David Mirren are, are leading that, but go, let's go back to the treatment algorithm for just a moment there, because I think for, at least for me, for clarification, everything on there has got validation in one study or another but a lot of these are in secondary prevention nobody has ever done this yeah. for these early plaques so i i mean for i believe it but but i i don't know if i'm talking to a patient or a, a colleague and i say you know here's this treatment algorithm it's a treatment algorithm that a very learned group put together and recommended but it's not validated on, on a primary prevention side. All, pieces of it are, but not cohesively. That, is that, that is a fair, yeah, is that that a fair is, statement? Like I think of those um, statins, bempedoic acid, zetia, 
Yeah, I mean, that's about it, right? That's about as, it. Yeah. As soon as you get in, I, I, but I think for clarification here, even aspirin, careful, you know, uh, but rivaroxaban, certainly, we don't have, we, we don't have that for primary prevention. We do not. Yeah. And so there's, that's why we've got to have the, you know, we've got to have RCT data, or if we do it, we've got to have a, a, a shared decision making with the patient and say, you know, here's what we're doing yeah. because we don't really have validation. And then the other thing, Rick, that people point out here is like, well, how are you going to afford that, right? You're going to put somebody on Ozempic, you're going to put them on Empagliflozin, and Rivaroxaban, let's throw in another one, in Glycerin. So now that's like $30,000 a year that you're spending on these drugs. By the end of the trial, um, all of these drugs, other than semaglutide and terzepatide, are, are going to be generic. So you, Rivaroxaban's going to be generic. The Evolucumab's going to be generic. So you, you can do this with generic medications at, if, if the trial's positive. Well, or you could do pieces of it. Certainly, I mean, statins are, don't cost yeah, anything exactly. anymore. So uh, that part is cheap. Now, let, let me pivot here for a moment because some people have access to a program like this. But let's try and make it a little bit more generic for, for those of us in the room who who I, I happen to have access to it, but not for all of, not for all the patients that I see. So somebody comes in uh, and they have chest discomfort. And one of our issues is that a lot of our readers, our CT readers, are saying there's stenosis or there isn't stenosis. And the question is, can we learn from, from the AI and from what you've done here and use that in clinical reading to begin to look at plaque more? And, uh, and that's, that's a little bit of a lift because you got some readers that will talk a lot about how much plaque is present without necessarily being able to quantitate it and what type of plaque they're seeing. Yeah. Because the proximal LAD lesion that looks, you know, like a moderate, uh, moderately stenotic lesion that's 100% calcified is a lot different to me than one that has, has very low attenuation. I think that's exactly right. So like, if you look at this, 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 so again, this was an interventional cardiologist. And when I said, okay, like, um, you know, he's, he actually has ischemia, uh, in the LAD and he's like, I don't care about the ischemia. I feel fine. Like, I don't care about the ischemia. What I care about is this plaque. Tell me how it's changing. I think this is a, this, this is like, I, what we've done is we've conflated two questions, right? When I was taught, we thought the symptomatic patient with chest pain was the one at risk. And if we could relieve the symptoms, we would reduce the risk. We were wrong. We relieve the symptoms. We do nothing to risk, right? So I think the risk is a medical therapy lifestyle um, question. And I think subsequently an interventional question, because I'm of the belief that like, if you're going to throw truly optimal medical therapy at somebody and they don't respond, um, their atherosclerosis, then I think we need another trial to just do prophylactic stenting of these asymptomatic high-risk lesions in proximal vessels. Yeah, again, careful that we need the trial because- We need the, the oh, we need the, the trial. I'm not saying like to do it, like, um, I, yeah, I don't want anybody in federal prison here, but like the, I think that that's ultimately where we're going. And if you think about what does that mean, that means let's, let's shift the whole field away from symptom-driven end-stage care to disease-based care because there are 60 million people walking around the US with triple vessel disease and left. I was just telling somebody today, like the, I, I went to uh, Michael Wolk's um, retirement party a couple of nights ago and the vice chair of radiology, who's about 50 years old, he was telling me like, oh yeah, my best friend just died, um, sudden coronary death. And I said, oh, that's tragic. And he said, yeah, and so I got a scan, a CT angiogram, and he's like, I've got multivessel coronary disease, like with high grade coronary lesions, stenosis in the LAD, completely asymptomatic. Like we're missing those people, right? Like, I mean, the one that we've never, the denominator that we've never touched is the people who die at home. So like, I just want to go out and find disease so that we can treat it effectively. And I do think there's a role for PCI in that. Yes. So what we thought we'd do as a follow on quickly is just talk about a practical implication. And I'll just tell you what we're doing at Lee Health. And Bob was right, we're fortunate we've been resourced to do some of this. And I don't have any disclosures other than the fact that, uh, that Jim and I have known one another for a long time and he helped us set up our CT program a long time ago and uh, my daughter uh, happens to work for Clearly as well. Uh, our program is based, we call it Heart Health also, on early detection of preclinical coronary plaque. So this is, a purely a primary prevention program. 
And it's also designed, as Jim pointed out, to track the effectiveness of medical uh, uh, interventions in the individual patient, <clears throat> not based on surrogate markers, but based on pl actual plaque, with the goal of reducing heart attacks uh, in our employees. Now, that last thing in red was important for me if you were going to try and do something that last piece is how I sold it to the, uh, to the finance people, because on the one hand, I said, look, it's the right thing to do to, in our own family, prevent heart attacks. But the other thing is that because of our 20,000 covered lives, since we have to pay for those costs, if one of you guys comes to my system and has a heart attack tomorrow, we make a lot of money. But if I have a heart attack, it is really expensive because they've got to pay for my costs and loss of, loss of productivity. So by reducing the risk of heart attacks, what we've got is a curve that, that according to our actuaries on our side, and also we've worked with the people on Clearly, we think the lines are going to cross at four years. That's a big deal. That means it's at that point, it's not just free. We're actually making money off of this. So we'll see if that works out. But the whole thing, and, uh, and Jim has talked about this, this is, uh, this is uh, from the uh, ischemia trial, but basically the concept of the difference in plaque, and I won't spend too much time. Now, y you can almost do some of this. Uh, the computer color codes it right so we can see what the type of plaque looks like with low-density plaque being red. But the truth of the matter is it's based on Hounsfield units. And when I don't have clearly, I don't know about you other readers, but a lot of times I'm hovering and trying to see how dense that plaque is to get a better idea more than just visually, but also uh, with measurements, what that type of plaque is. But the idea is you do a CT and you get that sort of information. And then we know, as Jim has alluded to, and this is actually one of his old slides, that there's a continuum on the left, high risk with that low attenuation plaque. And on the right, if you've got calcified plaque, the probability of an MI from that plaque is extremely low, even if it has significant stenosis. It's just not a high risk plaque. So a proximal LAD lesion of 80% um, that looks like the plaque on the left has got me jittery. And the one on the top right, really all I want to know is, are, is the patient highly symptomatic or not? Is it interfering with lifestyle? So here's an illustrative thing, and this is actually one of your cases, Jim. 56-year-old with atypical chest pain, treated hyperlipidemia, on the treadmill goes 13.4 mets. So this is a pretty active guy, looks really good, but then uh, gets a CT with AI, and this is what it looks like. Now, the bright stuff there is calcified plaque, of course, but... We can actually quantitate this and look, and if you look on that panel on the left side, it says 1329. That's, uh, that's cubic millimeters of plaque in the total, in the total vessel. That's a high number. We actually know statistically that's associated with increased likelihood of uh, event rates. And then we can break it down by vessel, as Jim said, in terms of both the quantitation in the pla in the particular vessels and, um, what it looks like, and then decide, and, and that alters therapy. So the elements of our program are, are, we first of all had to decide who are we going to scan. I'll show you that in a minute. We made it completely free to eligible health plan enrollees right now. That includes, uh, that includes our employees and their spouses, so about 20,000 covered lives. It's voluntary. People don't have to do it. Uh, unlike, by the way, for us, things like colonoscopy at a certain age in our health plan, maybe in yours too, Andy, if you don't get one, your premiums go up for your health plan, right? So, but in this case, this is totally voluntary. There are exclusions that you see there, but there aren't very many. Uh, enrollment is done by contact letters, phone contacts. And for the scan, our APPs that work for heart and vascular, put them on, make sure they get beta blocked. We use a lot of ivabradine. I don't know how many of you, you do you use a lot of ivabradine? No, we really do uh, anymore. And I got to tell you, our scan quality has, uh, uh, Bob, to what you were talking about, ivabradine works because you don't have that drop in blood pressure. I know it's off label. We can't get our payers to pay for it. We're, we're not talking about a regular prescription. We're talking about a couple of tablets. 
And so, you know, we're giving them, so we're not putting them on it permanently. We're giving them 10 or 15 milligrams of Evabradine the day before and 10 or 15 milligrams two hours before the scan. Because otherwise what happens, you got to be careful with beta blockers. A lot of these people, you give them a bunch of beta blockers, they get to the lab, their heart rate is high, your scanner's not that great. You're giving them IV beta blockers. Next thing you know, their blood pressure falls and you're, 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 you're lost. I've Aberdeen worse. So at any rate, uh, we do, we do the scans. We get the results, send them, uh, both. We have cardiology and radiology that work together on reviews. We use the AI. We send reports to the physicians and to the employee, and then we follow up and manage. So, uh, this is the workflow for us. The genetics piece is missing. We're, we're entering that. We hope in the next six months. Um, and so if you, the identification looks like this, you've seen this slide. So we get somebody scanned, we can sit down with them. We literally have a program. Our APPs do this because they do it better than our docs. And they sit down with the patient and they go over exactly the, the actually employee, the, it's preclinical, they're not patients and, um, and go over their uh, results. Uh, then we, uh, we uh, educate the physicians. We send a report to the uh, primary care physician. We educate the employee or patient, as it were, uh, and then we implement. And we use that same stage pathway that Jim alluded to before. Uh, and it's a little bit, you know, we had to figure out some way to categorize this, and this is how we do it, by uh, uh, by. Uh, 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 percent atherosclerotic volume, which the, um, uh, the uh, program gives us. And it's based on this paper from uh, uh, JCCT uh, from a couple of years ago from a number of people that you know. Uh, and basically the stages are here. Then we manage and we do that based on this uh, heart health treatment algorithm, similar to what Jim uh, had. Ours is a little bit different, but it's based on this paper. Uh, that was in uh, AJ, uh, AJM, uh, actually published earlier this year. Uh, and then we track and we base our, our repeat scans look like this. If they have no disease at all, then we do it in four years. That becomes really important about the patient that you mentioned because we've had a couple of people that were on statins because their LDL starting was 140 and they got put on a statin and they came in and they've got no plaque, nothing. And we're then having sheer decision making with them, and we're saying, "Look, Bob, if you want, you can stay on your statin, but frankly, you got no plaque. And if you go off your statin, it's okay because we're going to rescan you in four years. And if all of a sudden you're growing plaque, we so we have a huge advantage being able to rescan. But those stage threes, we're rescanning at one year, and then we track and we sit down with them, and we can show them exactly what has happened to their plaque and then hopefully we prevent so we did our first 400 employees and our only cut point was they had to be age 40 we're now in phase two and we've refined that for cost con concerns uh, based on the on our roi projections our return on investment projections so we're doing 45 with one risk factor it could be combination but they have to have at least one diabetes hypertension hyperlipidemia or a bmi of over 30 and we're we're well into that uh, phase but if you look at our first 400 this is i i think really fascinating and we don't know what to do with this yet but the old, that little sliver of blue up at the top that four percent those are the ones that had no plaque we found plaque in 96% of the people. Now, remember, Miami Heart was published, what, a year and a half ago? And what, was it 56%? Yeah. I think it's 56%. Uh, and it was a similar cohort, and not too far off of this. And theirs was 56, and ours is 96. And the difference, I'm going to tell you, the difference is AI. I mean, it's picking up these tiny, tiny amounts of plaque. Now, I'm not sure I know what to do with that. But it's, it's interesting, and I will tell you as a reader, what happens is I look at the CT, and I think I'm reasonably good, and, I look, and it looks fine, and then I look at the AI, and it says, oh, there's something in the proximal circ, and I go back and I look at the CT scan, and I say, darn, there was something there. I mean, it's very subtle, but I'm not sure we know what to do with that big yellow box yet. Okay, we're, we're having, for us, we're having shared decision making. But here is, here's the one that worries me a little bit. Of the stage one, 
60% of those had no calcium. They've got plaque, but it's not calcified. Now, it's very early plaque, almost all of it. But the other yellow box is the one that's really interesting. 17% of the people with advanced plaque had a risk score of less than 5%. And these people, I'm telling you, have really crummy-looking arteries. But if, we had, if they had come in and they're asymptomatic and we all pull out our phone and we do a risk calculation, 17% of these people are less than 5%. You say, have a nice day. We'll see you again. You don't need me. And that part is scary. Now, this is a small N. I, this is not statistically significant. We're, we're building up the numbers, but preliminarily, uh, that one ter that number terrified me. So what's happened with our rescans? Really small numbers here. So take it for what it is. The people that we've rescanned so far that had stage three disease, the mean total plaque volume was pretty flat. No surprise, right? The calcified plaque went up. And by the way, let me go back for a minute. Notice that the total plaque volume on one person at the top went up. Everybody else's was stable or it went down a little bit. But you had one person that went way up. That Remember that guy. Because it's the same one as this top number. That's the same individual. That calcified plaque went way up. And look at non-calcified plaque. And guess which one it is. That same patient had a 26% reduction in non-calcified plaque on treatment. So if we went by total plaque volume or PAV, actually, Jim, we would have said he, pro he progressed. Uh, and we looked at this and we said, no, you've converted your plaque over to calcified plaque. This is great news. And look at the, the red. Again, this is a small end, but what's happening is directionally, I'm pretty happy with what's going on. So I, I told you that he's color-challenged. But we did find a T-shirt for you, just so you know. Uh, like binding. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's Oh, it looks so good on you. Okay. It's all right. Well, thank you, everybody, for your attention this morning. We really appreciate it.